Good evening. My name is Tom Giroux, and I'm on the board of directors for the Forest History Association of Wisconsin. I'd like to welcome you to this webinar tonight. Uh, first, though, we'll do a little shameless promotion of the Forest History Association of Wisconsin. You can see our mission on the screen right now, inform, educate, archive, and publish. These webinars are part of our inform and educate portion of our mission. Uh, they're free of charge and open to the public. And I think we've had some really good programs. If you're interested, you could always go back to our YouTube channel and watch some of the previous pro programs. Uh, so if you'd like to support our mission, I'd encourage you to become a member of the Forest History Association of Wisconsin. It's uh, $20 a year for an individual member, and you can see more information uh, on our website. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague who helps me with these webinars, Don Schnitz Schnitzler. Hi there, as Tom said, my name is Don Schnitzler. I'm also a member of the Forest History Association of Wisconsin Board of Directors, and I'm pleased to welcome everyone tonight to tonight's webinar presentation. Uh, before we get started with that presentation, a couple of housekeeping issues that we try to take care of before each webinar so that they run smoothly. Uh, if as you're listening to the presentation, you have any questions, at the bottom of the screen is a little chat feature. Tom has already turned it on for the uh, for the, tonight's webinar. Uh, if you have questions, though, you can jot those questions down in that chat feature. We'll hold all questions until the end of the presentation and then relay them to Eric so he can answer them. If you have any technical difficulties, if, if something's not working, you think we might be able to fix it, use that same sat, chat feature to reach Tom or I, and we will do what we can in the background to solve the problems. Um, and then lastly, as Tom mentioned, the webinar is being recorded. We will have it up and running on our YouTube channel by sometime tomorrow morning. Uh, if everything goes the way it's supposed to, it should take no time at all to get it up on the YouTube channel. So this evening's talk is entitled The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in Wisconsin. Uh, it's being presented by Eric Reinhardt. Uh, since 2002, Eric has been the Corps of Engineers Curator in the Office of History Headquarters, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, prior to that, he worked for the National Park Service, first as a museum technician at Manhattan sites, uh, and then as curator of Andersonville uh, National Historic Site and the National Prisoner of War Museum. He has a bachelor's degree from Trinity University and a master's degree from the University of Texas at San Antonio, both in history. Uh, tonight's presentation will discuss um, the work that the Army Corps of Engineers have done over the past two centuries in developing the infrastructure in Wisconsin. The focus is going to be on the civil works side of it rather than on the military history. And so with that, I am pleased to turn this PowerPoint or this program over to our speaker tonight, Eric Reinhardt. Eric, welcome. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank the Forest History Association of Wisconsin for this opportunity to talk a little bit about Corps of Engineers civil works history in the state. And get the, there we go, get the PowerPoint up. And I'd like to apologize in advance for my likely mispronunciation of some Wisconsin place names. First, to set the stage, I'm going to talk a little bit of some general history background of the Corps of Engineers. I'm going to start with the key legislation in Army engineer history, which you can see. And uh, I've underlined and will highlight the most important dates for our purposes here. 1775, Congress establishes the Continental Army with the provision for a chief engineer. In 1824, the General Survey Act authorizes Army engineers to survey road and canal routes. This legislation is key because it is the authorizing, enabling legislative authority for all subsequent Army engineer civil works programs. In 1899, the Refuse Act, which is a section of the Rivers and Harbors Act of 1899, 
gave Army engineers the authority to clear obstacles to navigation and to prohibit dumping of refuse and trash into waterways except by permit. The 1917 Flood Control Act gave the Corps of Engineers formal authority to develop and execute flood control projects. And in 1944, the Flood Control Act of that year authorizes recreation on Corps of Engineers projects. The next thing to talk about in, gen in general Corps of Engineers history is how the Corps of Engineers does business. Generally, uh, Congress authorizes a project and then funds it. It's a two-step process, and this was very common in the 19th century uh, where a project would be authorized and small amounts of money over time were allocated by Congress to complete these projects. This situation generally made the Corps very cautious with the with its authorities and what Congress allowed it to do, Some, something that is, uh, continues to this day. And of course, very early on with uh, Congress's job to authorize and then uh, resource projects, it was subject to political and public pressures. One other general thing to be aware of, general element of Corps of Engineer history to be aware of, is that there is a solid dividing line of the Civil War. Prior to the Civil War, there was the Corps had a very limited role in developing the nation, uh, a very small number of Civil Works projects, both in terms of resources uh, and political philosophy at the time, too. After the Civil War, there was a vast expansion of the role of federal government throughout all of U.S. life, and of course, the vast economic, technological, and scientific expansion overall throughout the country. And obviously these changes were not felt across the board, of course, but by the late 19th century, the Corps of Engineers had embraced the progressive area of belief in technology and science and engineering as problem solving and support for the nation's commerce and growth. This presentation is structured to describe the work in Wisconsin by mission areas. Note that I won't be able to cover everything the Corps did or does and I have to limit myself to the, the to uh, the subject areas uh, of core work on Great Lake Harbors, river navigation, flood control and mitigation, environmental issues, and then a couple of other uh, missions to mention at the end. Next, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the Corps of Engineers organization in Wisconsin. So the slide you see up here is the current uh, organization, and you'll see how several districts overlap the state and have uh, uh, differing missions. But overall, in a word, it's it's complicated. Uh, the way the core initially functioned, uh, offices were located by projects, so there was no permanent presence anywhere, at least by design. So when a project was authorized, an off an office would be set up to manage that project, and then when the project was completed, Army engineers often moved on. Although in the case of Wisconsin, there was more or less a permanent presence from the 1830s on due to Lake Harbor work. The very first Corps of Engineers office in that general region was in Chicago uh, to work on Chicago Harbor work. But very quickly, satellite offices were established in Milwaukee and Duluth, Minnesota by the 1840s. After the Civil War, the volume of new projects led to the Corps' very permanent presence in a lot of locations in Wisconsin. Uh, and the general region, and these organizations involved into formal districts. In 1888, the Chief of Engineers created five Geographic Army Engineer divisions under which these districts were established, finally formally named throughout, uh, uh, the districts were formally named, although many had existed for quite a long time as project offices. This would become the course organizational model through today, uh, districts uh, and divisions up through the chain. As this structure evolved, district borders were not always solidly set, and there was some overlap. What does all this mean for Wisconsin? I had mentioned the Chicago office initially was responsible for the first harbor work, and that uh, and it was project-specific offices initially. Chicago was the center, but uh, I mentioned a, a, a subsequent to that, an office was established in Milwaukee. In 1874, the Chicago district was formally designated. Another district that grew with Wisconsin work was in Rock Island, Illinois, because it had responsibility for the Mississippi River, and this included the rivers in southern Wisconsin that emptied into the Mississippi. 
Rock Island was formally designated a district in 1878. Rock Island and Chicago handled most of the Wisconsin work until the establishment of a Milwaukee district in 1916, which took over harbor work in the state. Uh, you'll note from the map that there is no longer a Milwaukee district, though. Rocket Island and Chicago handled most of the Wisconsin work, as said. Uh, uh, but uh, the Corps of Engineers also had a presence in St. Paul, which did work on the upper Mississippi navigation, which became a district in 1867. In the late 19th century, there was some friction between St. Paul and Rock Island over who was responsible for what portions of the Mississippi. Further complicating the picture was the establishment of the Duluth District in 1866 to take some of the Western Harbor work and later uh, manage the Duluth Canal. Finally, the Detroit District, which was established in 1841, also worked on harbor ports. Today, as you can see, the Corps' presence in Wisconsin is still Rock Island on the southern portion of the state, responsible for parts of the Mississippi River, St. Paul, responsible for the western area and most of the state, and the upper Mississippi and other rivers. Uh, uh, Chicago on, along the eastern edge, responsible for Lake Michigan harbors and Lake Winnebago, and the Detroit district responsible for the northern edge of the state and Lake Superior harbors. Now I'm going to start talking about uh, the core history by missions and projects, and I'll start with harbor development. The earliest uh, engineer presence were uh, active duty military engineers in Wisconsin, whose role were limited to construction of outposts and temporary road building to serve the out, those outposts. But also by the 1820s, uh, you had Army engineer officers doing surveys. Uh, significant surveys of the region took place in 1816 and in 1820, uh, where, which was the 1820 uh, survey was described. Most of the four month long travels were by canoe along the rivers they explored were the Wisconsin River, the Upper Mississippi, the Fox River, the mouth of the Milwaukee River, as well as the Wisconsin coasts of Lake Superior and Michigan. Another survey uh, occurred, uh, took place in 1823. Uh, re recall I mentioned the General Survey Act of 1824, which was the precedent for how civil works projects would be done. But the, the first projects to follow that model were not actually in Wisconsin. In 1864, by a, uh, survey of, uh, a, a survey of the harbor in Presque Island in Erie, Pennsylvania by Army engineers, was done. And based on that report, Congress first authorized improvements to the harbor. Note that Congress didn't actually authorize the funds, but this was the, the business model that was set from there on. In the wake of the various surveys in the early 1820s, there were uh, there were there weren't there were very few resources to do any work, and what was available during that decade was concentrated on improving the harbor at Chicago rather than in uh, any of the harbors in Wisconsin. So aside from those early surveys, Wisconsin didn't really get any attention until the late 1830s when, to quote the St. Paul district history, in April 1839, the Army Engineer Topographic Bureau assigned Captain Thomas Jefferson Cram, an 1822 West Point graduate, to be a general superintendent for harbor works on Lake Michigan and the roads in Wisconsin territory. He set up his headquarters at Racine at the mouth of the Root River in Wisconsin territory. For the first time, all civil works activities in the United States Army on the shores of Lake Michigan were placed under the direction of a single office. Graham was a fortunate choice because he was motivated to immediately get to work and conduct updated and further surveys of the region, including the Wisconsin-Michigan Border Survey. His results and, the, and border recommendations were accepted by Congress by passing the 1846 Wisconsin Enabling Act. In addition to Lake Harbor surveys, he also surveyed the Wisconsin and Fox Rivers and suggested projects to improve them. Graham was also present during a brief period of congressional support for harbor and road development before the Civil War. It came at a time where the region was growing rapidly with Wisconsin soon to become a state, with citizens starting to exert political pressure for development. First, Captain Cram quickly moved to use already appropriated funds on road building in Wisconsin. Cram himself wrote later that he estimate, quote, estimated that there were over 1,100 miles of road involved and that they were all laid out four rods wide and in the woods and opened and in open to the width and in the woods open to a width of two rods. These were mostly in Michigan and Wisconsin. Uh, 
Second, he had a brief window for a harbor development, uh, imp uh, harbor improvement project. Congress had supported the extensive Lake Harbor surveys mentioned above, conducted by Cram and his staff, and the data was there to start making improvements to Wisconsin harbors. So in 1843, Congress pro appropriated $75,000 for Lake Michigan harbor improvements, 24,000 of which was to be for Wisconsin at a place selected by Army engineers, which would be Milwaukee. Though some work was done on this harbor improvement project, Cram's engineers and the Milwaukee city leadership soon disagreed on the location of the harbor entrance. Cram was soon transferred out in 1843 before the disagreement was resolved, but he was vindicated later when a special engineering board established to examine the question agreed with him. But after that brief window, the political winds were definitely shifting. This quote from the 1840 platform of the Democratic Party adopted in Baltimore, Maryland, in May of that year, kind of sums it up. Resolved that the Constitution does not confer upon the general government the power to commence and carry on a general system of internal improvements. This resolution was repeated at each Democratic platform up to the Civil War. Of course, not all the presidents from 1840 to the Civil War were Democrats, but the ones that were adhered to that platform. Eric, I'm uh, sorry to interrupt, but I want to know, we're still on the Milwaukee Harbor slide? Yes. That, oh, okay, yes. I just wanted to make sure that's where you wanted to be. Sorry to interrupt. No, that's all right. That's all right. There was another brief window in 1844 when Wisconsin received Harbor Development federal funds over the veto of President John Tyler. $20,000 more for Milwaukee Harbor, plus $12,000 to develop the harbor in Racine. Harbor improvements tended to be building piers on cribs out to each side of the harbor and dredging the deeper channel. Needless to say, in most cases, this was a temporary solution because the lake quickly refilled the channels, although sometimes the local city would build or extend the piers on their own to maintain viability. At this point in the 1840s, Chicago, Southport, Racine, and Milwaukee were the only harbors on the western shore of Lake Michigan, which had been improved. From Milwaukee to the entrance of Green Bay, about 150 miles, there were no man-made harbors at all. After the 1844 appropriation, President James K. Polk vetoed all harbor improvement bills that came to his desk in 1846 and 1847. Finally, in 1853, Wisconsin got more federal funding for harbor improvements. This was the last uh, funding it would get before the Civil War. The Milwaukee Harbor was allot allotted 15000 to be extended from the point of Milwaukee River, known as the, as the North Cut. Kenosha, Racine, and Sheboygan Harbors re ten received $10,000, where Manitowoc Harbor was allotted 8000 After this, President Pierce like uh, Polk before him vetoed every internal improvement bill which came to his desk in line with the philosophy of the Democratic Party. Ah. Part of the 1853 project involved dredging. The harbor superintendent in 1844 to 1855 was now Lieutenant Colonel James Graham. And he was a really busy guy with the uh, 1853 projects and also local projects because at that time, government resources were allowed to be used by local cities if they paid for it. There was only one government dredge and everyone wanted to use it in their harbor. Also remember, he was not just responsible for Wisconsin harbors and he ended up with a bizarre situation where under Graham's predecessor, the citizens of Chicago had seized the army dredge there that was there and used it themselves illegally to clear sand that had effectively closed the harbor. Lieutenant Colonel Graham was able to convince the citizens of Chicago to return the dredge. Next, the dredge was assigned to Milwaukee, Racine, and Kenosha harbors. In the meantime, Chicago had sanded back in almost immediately and was applying pressure to get the dredge back. Knowing what Chicago had done and that the working season was getting close to ending, the citizens of Kenosha seized the dredge to prevent it from going back to Chicago. This quote in the St. Paul history describes the situation. In September of 1855, the city council of Kenosha, accompanied by the sheriff of Kenosha County, removed from the dredge, the pile driver, dredge bucket, 
some chains and other items, and also took over separate pile drivers and the scow vessels. Lieutenant Colonel Graham was relatively patient with the citizens of Kenosha, even as he reminded them of the penalties for, quote, each case of conspiracy by false, pre by false pretenses against your country. The Kenosha mayor and city council relented after a few days and returned the items. The last of the 1843 appropriations were expended in 1856 with more work in Milwaukee. As mentioned, there wouldn't be any more core work until after the Civil War. Another factor that was starting to influence uh, the situation by the 1850s, you have the railroads coming in and changing the dynamics, although it would be years before they displaced water transport. Initially, they complemented harbors by bringing goods to them for water shipment out. In the case of Milwaukee, uh, in the case of Wisconsin, Milwaukee had the first railroads operating by 1855. However, the effect was negligible until after the Civil War, and the harbor cities in Wisconsin were more or less on their own until then. One final note to make before talking about the tremendous post-Civil War economic expansion and the Corps' role in it. I mentioned how the Corps would generally would conduct surveys, make, a, make recommendations, then Congress would authorize and pay for or not, as the case may be, for projects. However, this was not just a case of engineers and their pet projects or local citizens applying political pressure. Uh, this was kind of a two-way street. The Corps also wanted a mechanism to potentially curb Congress from authorizing and funding questionable projects. So the Corps developed a system where their projects were evaluated by a separate engineer board, which would make its own recommendations whether the projects were feasible and effective from an engineering standpoint and whether they were economically justifiable. It was in this environment the, of the larger post-war boom in harbor improvements took place. And in 1902, a formal board of engineers for rivers and harbors was established to evaluate harbor pro and river projects, which lasted until 1992. I should note that uh, with the slides, uh, there's simply not a big pool of images to draw from 19th century harbor improvements for Wisconsin. So I had to draw from much later ones. And these are just illustrative in nature of the work that was done primarily post-Civil War. Which, of course, as mentioned, uh, pretty much uh, swept away any doubts of the constitutionality of federal support for harbor improvements. And harbor improvement funding started even before the end of the Civil War. In June 1864, during the first session of the 38th Congress, uh, a bill was approved that provided $250,000 for the repair and preservation of harbors on the Great Lakes. And there was a lot to make up for since little work had been done since 1856. And what had been done was ad hoc and not always up to the standards, uh, 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 high engineering standards, because they were done by the harbor cities themselves. From 1866 to 1870, Congress funded improvements that were carried out by Army engineers in Kenosha, Racine, Wisconsin, uh, 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 Milwaukee, Sheboygan, and Manitowoc. New har har harbors were developed by the Corps at, at uh, places like uh, Menominee, Algoma, Two Rivers, and Port Washington. These improvements were still, still followed the pre-war pattern and built on original designs, but extended the piers even farther and deepened the channel. Uh, the reason, of course, to extend the piers was to reach deeper waters and because sand continually built up. And of course, uh, the post-Civil War boom, uh, vessels started getting a lot larger. One ma specific uh, major Wisconsin Harbor improvement to discuss after the Civil War didn't start out as a core project. The Sturgeon Bay and Lake Michigan Ship Canal was a private venture to cut a canal through Sturgeon Bay to Lake Michigan and shorten the route to the lake. And it was completed in 1881. In 1893, Congress authorized and funded the federal government purchase of the canal and the Corps has improved and operated it and maintained it since then. Also by 1880, engineering had become a lot more sophisticated. The harbor improvements I just described uh, became, be, uh, became a lot more sophisticated, uh, adding revetments along the harbors uh, to protect the channel from wave action and breakwaters outside the harbor entrance to prevent sanding. Of course, it varied from harbor to harbor and the design would be tailored, tailored to local conditions. And it was a, uh, each, each individual harbor would have a different design and it was very much evolutionary.
about also about this time, timber, which had become more expensive, was no longer used for constructing or repairing harbor works because it was replaced by concrete, which was not only less expensive, but more permanent. In addition, uh, uh, it helped uh, keep the minimal ch channel the channel open because the minimal depth became deep, deeper and deeper over time. And the switch to concrete has a Wisconsin connection. The development of the first practical reinforced concrete caisson in 1908 in the United States took place at the Milwaukee Harbor. Army engineer Major William Judson designed and patented the concrete caisson, which replaced the old style timber cribs filled with stone. The new caisson was fabricated on shore, towed into position, and sunk by filling the hollow middle with stone. It was cheaper and more durable than the old timber cribs. One trivia footnote to Judson's caissons is this. In 1907, a year before uh, the development was done and patented, a first lieutenant, Douglas MacArthur, was an assistant to Major Judson in the Milwaukee district in carrying out Corps of Engineers responsibilities at Green Bay and other Lake Michigan ports. Unfortunately, there is no evidence to suggest MacArthur had any role in Judson's caissons. Another notable development in harbor uh, development design also took place in Wisconsin, the development of Arrowhead Harbors. In 1905, a special study was done of all Wisconsin lake harbors and found that wave action was causing damage to waves. First, all harbors narrow, so waves entering the harbor with such force to damage ships there and the harbor infrastructure. Uh, the problem became apparent as the harbors got deeper, especially 20 feet and more. And second, the recession of these same waves created an undertow as water rushed back behind them that was dangerous and damaging the infrastructure as well. The solution was to build two breakwaters that met at a 90 degree angle and turn back uh, uh, with turn back ends, looks like an air, looking like an arrowhead that created an outer harbor to dissipate the wave action, but allowing waves to expand the outer harbor rather than inside the inner harbor. This is a modern example, of course, uh, but the principles are still the same. I like to cite this as an example of the progressive era of faith in science and technology, and also the wide latitude that Army engineers had at that time to study and experiment, both in the classroom and at the Engineer School of Application, as well as out in the field. The examples like these are the precursor to today's Army Corps of Engineers Engineer Research and Development Mission. And in fact, uh, the image uh, that is there is from uh, the Engineer Research and Development Center where they're studying uh, different kinds of breakwaters that still have that same arrowhead design. Although unfortunately I couldn't find one from Wisconsin, this one's from Cleveland. By 1916, this post-war uh, burst of federal harbor development was over. The nature of commercial uh, uh, shipping had changed by then. The decline of lumber, the role, of, uh, the role of railroads, changing commercial patterns all contributed, and there was a lull in new large harbor projects until the New Deal, which brought in more Corps of Engineers resources for maintenance of existing projects. Talk a little bit about Lake Superior harbors. These harbors were developed much later than those on Lake Michigan. They include Ashland, Port Wing, Cornucopia, Bayfield, La Pointe, and Saxon Harbors, and the Duluth Superior Canal. All of these were developed in the late 19th century, and though these harbors benefited in the early 20th century exporting lumber and iron ore, today most of them are shallow draft recreational harbors except for Ashford, although all are still maintained by the Corps, just like the ones on Lake Michigan. The Duluth Superior Harbor is the exception, uh, and of course it has a very interesting history. Geographically, Superior Wisconsin was better placed in the competition between it and Duluth. The peninsula jutting out from the Minnesota side meant that vessels had to enter the bay on the other side from Minnesota, but near next to Superior, where there was a break in the land. However, Duluth had the advantage of being a railroad, railroad hub, thus providing better access for goods coming in and out of the port. The court was caught in between, and in 1869, it proposed three options build a breakwater outside the Minnesota port and a new harbor there, cut a canal through the Minnesota point on the west side to access Duluth, or to continue to use the Superior entrance but improve the harbor inside the bay by dredging a channel from Superior to Duluth. The Corps went with the third option. However, while the Corps was studying and deciding, 
Duluth residents took matters in its own into their own hands. And in 1870 and 71, they dug a canal at the Minnesota Point. Wisconsin officials worried that a canal would divert water and destroy the harbor entrance on the Wisconsin side of the land. And also, they didn't like the competition. Tried to stop it with legal action, but it was too late. Since the court had responsibility for all other elements of the, of the Duluth Superior Harbor, Congress authorized the purchase of the canal in 1897, and the Corps took it over and has managed it ever since. Duluth went on to become a leading inland port of the U.S. for the next 100 years, but Superior was not abandoned. In 1902, the Corps replaced the piers there, supervised by Major David Gayard, later of Panama Canal fame, using concrete rather than lumber. Again, because it was cheaper, and it was another, and it's another uh, early example of early use of concrete in harbor development. After World War II, the Corps mostly continued what it had done previously, maintaining existing harbors, sometimes expanding them as ships grew larger, especially with the opening of St. Lawrence route, the St. Lawrence Seaway in 1959. In other cases, some Wisconsin ports were downgraded to recreation only as late commerce changed over time. In 1932, Congress expanded the definition of waterborne commerce to include the use of waterways by seasonal passenger craft, yachts, houseboats, fishing boats, motorboats, and other similar watercraft, whether or not operated for hire. So that allowed uh, harbors to shift to a recreational uh, function rather than commerce. But, and the deep, waters, deep water harbors that remain on Lakes on the Lake Superior side are primarily used for ore transport. Next, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, river navigation and Corps of Engineers development. Of course, the Corps has uh, spent a great deal of effort on improving navigation on the Upper Mississippi, including 12 lock and dam sites operated by the Rock Island District today. Since these are on the river itself between Minnesota or Iowa and Wisconsin, rather than inside the state of Wisconsin, I'm not going to talk much about them, but rather concentrate on the three main rivers or five main rivers in the state, the Black, Wisconsin, Fox, Chippewa, and St. Croix. The Black River didn't see much in the way of commercial navigation before uh, or even through the lumber era, and the Corps didn't even try to survey it until uh, conduct a recent uh, uh, an updated survey until 1876, and the res and the results of that survey recommended no improvements at all. It wasn't until the 1830s that the Corps improved the Black River outlet at the Mississippi River at La Crosse. So essentially, uh, the Black River was really left at the mercy of the lumber industry. Fox River, Wisconsin, and Fox Rivers. The Wisconsin River, on the other hand, was seen as a potential commercial water route. Locals had grand dreams by connecting the Wisconsin to the Fox River by a canal. It was believed that a Mississippi to Lake Michigan waterway would turn Green Bay into a rival city to Chicago and would be the route to get Wisconsin lumber and grain to the nation. The Corps surveyed the area in the 1830s and agreed that it was feasible and suggested a, a system of locks and river improvements that would be needed. Several attempts were made by private companies to build the canal at Portage, Wisconsin, where the two rivers were only two miles apart, finally succeeding in 1851. The canal opened when the Corps was temporarily out of the civil works business, so to speak, uh, before the Civil War. And by the time it came back after the Civil War, circumstances had changed, though it took a while to realize it after Congress authorized the acquisition of the canal in 1872. By then, of course, the railroads were ascendant and it became clear that both the Fox and Wisconsin rivers would need a great deal of work to make them navigable, although the local boosters wanted it done because they thought rail rates were too high. It wasn't just a case of clearing snags and dredging, but, uh, but also clearing permanent structures and prevent the, uh, uh, and uh, constructing new ones to prevent the constantly forming sandbars and maintain the depth, not to mention the pre-existing privately built dams and other structures on the Wisconsin and Fox Rivers, which needed significant rebuilding, plus those structures related to the lumber industry. Ultimately, there was not enough river commerce to justify core improvements. The subject of the Fox Wisconsin Rivers improvement was referred to a board of engineers, which in 1887 recommended against any further attempt to improve the Wisconsin River. 
the Corps did continue to improve and maintain the Fox River from the canal to Green Bay, but it was never a major commercial waterway, benefiting local interests only. And significant Corps work ended in, 18, in 1908, other than maintenance and dredging. In 1922, Congress recommended closing the river to navigation, or the Corps recommended closing the river for navigation. And with no action from Congress, it did so in 1951 and later turned over responsibility to the state of Wisconsin 10 years later. So people can get their bearings on where the rivers are. As soon as logging began in Wisconsin, the Chippewa became the main river used by loggers because its source was in the upper pine forest and, and it empties into the Mississippi. The first sawmills appeared at Chippewa Falls around 1831, and to quote the St. Paul District history, more than 15 billion feet of logs were taken from the Chippewa flowage in a 50-year period from 1855 to 1905. Given the lack of interest in civil war works projects prior to the Civil War, uh, core involvement on the Chippewa really started, of course, after uh, which, of course, logging had uh, really taken off by then as well. And logging caused really, really big problems on the river. All the companies built their own dams to power their sawmills and to hold their logs and control the water flow to their advantage, not to mention huge obstructions caused by the logs. Cities didn't get enough water to power their own industries and use of the river for limited navigation. And gig uh, gigantic log jams closed the river constantly and the companies themselves fought each other using the river as a weapon. The Corps was often asked to referee a lot of these disputes, but had a real hard time doing it. Although the Corps conducted a, a survey with improvement recommendations in 1876, there was only so much that could be done. Some wing dams and jetties were built upstream at, at the Mississippi mouth, but that was it. Prior to this, prior to the 18. 99 Refuse Act that I mentioned at the start, the Corps didn't have the authority to assert navigation rights, and Congress gave it no specific legislative authority on the Chippewa. Plus, there was a general sense from Congress that logging was navigation, indicating satisfaction with the status quo. Yet the intensive logging and associated activities were clearly damaging the river and affecting other industries, not just navigation. Even though the 1899 Refuse Act finally gave the Corps authority to assert the primacy of navigation on the Chippewa and remove obstacles, Congress still gave it no specific regulatory direction, and the Corps could not do much other than to try to negotiate between the locals and the lumbermen, mostly unsuccessfully, at least on behalf of the locals. What really solved the problem was the collapse of the logging industry in the first decade of the 20th century. Ultimately, the Corps did perform work on the Chippewa, but it was mostly removing snags and logs and debris left behind by the lumber companies. The St. Croix River was a very similar situation to the Chippewa. Massive logging, alterations to the river flow, cutthroat lumber company competition, and friction between local lumber industry and out-of-state corporations, and locals versus the lumber industry. In the case of the St. Croix, where there was more navigation than on the Chippewa, the Corps tried to mediate disputes and create a compromise, which again largely failed. Corps national leadership hesitated to try to enforce the Refuse Act, and the lumber companies did not give an inch, and they even got Congress to amend the Refuse Act by eliminating the prohibition against floating loose timbers and logs, and the lumber industry was allowed to sluice logs whenever they wished, as long as they not, did not jam the main channel. This was wildly out of touch with reality, because of the problems logs caused while technically not blocking the channel and sluicing logs worked against the Corps' efforts to maintain a navigable channel. Again, the immediate problems eased with the collapse of the lumber industry, but like with the Chippewa, the Corps was stuck with the cleanup. Quoting the St. Paul history again, between 1931 and 1940, it pulled an additional 6,219 log snags out of the St. Croix. In addition, no navigation improvements could be done until these problems were cleaned up. The Corps of Engineers did not attempt any improvements on the St. Croix between 1907 and 1922. After that, the Corps did go back to work dredging and maintaining a channel, but this was mostly for coal shipments to power plants and Mississippi River barges, as rapid co as rap river commerce had drastically declined by then. And as time went on, there emerged a rapidly 
growing recreational roof, uh, use of the St. Croix River that the, I'll talk about a little bit uh, later. Later in the, in the 20th century, the Corps did propose a dam and reservoir on the St. Croix or, uh, 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 or on one of its tributaries, but again, we'll get to that in a minute. To summarize the core work on the Black, Chippewa, and St. Croix rivers, the St. Paul history stated, looking back over the 75-year period of 1840 to 1915, when lumbering constituted the major industry in western Wisconsin, it is evident that the lumber industry enjoyed an unrestrained exploitation of the bountiful forests, along with the Black, Chippewa, and St. Croix watersheds. The Corps became an active agent in river management after large lumber corporations had already jammed the rivers with logs and built hundreds of state authorized dams. District engineers became concerned about the arrogant assumption of timber syndicates that they could wantonly control the nation's waterways. Core regulatory powers, however, came too late to save one of our country's largest forest reserves. The next mission I wanna talk about is flood mitigation. Sometimes uh, use the term flood control, but that's that uh, is kind of an archaic term. Now we we talk about flood mitigation. As mentioned with the uh, enabling legislation at the beginning, in 1917 the Corps was given formal authority for flood control projects, and of course that immediately makes you think of big dams and levees and flood control structures. And this wouldn't necessarily be wrong. However, since the 1970s, the Corps has considered non-structural and other types of solutions as well. In the case of Wisconsin, the Corps has built flood control dams and has managed two significant non-structural solutions to flooding. First, the dams and lakes. Lake Winnebago on the lower Fox River. The Corps didn't build this as the lake is not man-made, but the dams constructed over time on the Fox and Wisconsin rivers have raised the lake level and it requires close monitoring. There are nine dams along the lower Fox operated by the Army Corps of Engineers with another four privately owned dams. Close coordination is necessary to manage the water flow. In addition, managing water to prevent floods, the water levels are regulated to provide recreation opportunities, ensure there is enough water for downstream hydropower dams and for environmental reasons. The Ogal River in Wisconsin. The Ogal Dam was constructed in 1965 to 1969 on a small tributary of the Chippewa River for the protection of the community of Spring Valley, Wisconsin. In addition to flood prevention, the lake provides all manner of recreation such as fishing, boating, playgrounds, swimming, camping, nature trail facilities, and, 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 and other uh, opportunities for area residents. The dam was extremely popular at the time due, due, due to its flood control and recreation opportunities. There's also been another sorts of uh, flood protection that the Corps has undertaken in Wisconsin. The Prairie du Chien relocation. Prairie du Chien, where the Wisconsin River meets the Mississippi, is very much subject to floods with record-breaking floods in 1965, and it's flooded seven times between 1965 and 75 with pretty, pretty devastating floods. Congress authorized a flood evacuation and relocation plan for Prairie du Chien in March, on March uh, 7th, 1974, in consultation with the residents. The flood damage reduction project acquired 121 properties between February 1978 and September 1984. And as you can see from the slide, uh, uh, structures were picked up and moved in a lot of cases. Around the same time, the Wisconsin city of Soldiers Grove initiated a non-structural solution to reduce flood damage from the Kickapoo River. This effort began in 1979 after a serious flood the year before. The village rejected a levee plan and instead proposed, proposed moving houses and, biz and the business district to higher ground. After a number of years of bureaucratic delays and another big flood, the Corps managed the town's move in a five-year process that was completed in 1983. Now I'm going to talk about, tell you the story of two dams that were never built. First, the St. Croix Dam. The St. Croix River is prone to flooding, especially the city of Stillwater. A devastating 1965 flood led to a Corps of Engineers study that found 
found it, though the, the St. Croix Dam itself was unsuitable, several possible spots on tributaries would provide flood protection. Unlike the Ogal Dam of the same period, the proposed St. Croix Dam ran into immediate and ferocious opposition, although there was strong local support. The Corps pointed out the recreation value and hydropower generation and that the area really was not wild and natural. In fact, it was cut over timberland. But you can see from the slide uh, uh, the, the, that uh, uh, a critical view of uh, the Corps' uh, uh, emphasis on the positives of a, of a St. Croix Dam. Uh, there's another uh, another two things important to note at this time. Prior to 1968, the policy of the Corps was that preservation of beauty and wilderness could not be placed on an equal footing with the national economic growth or regional needs. This project actually led to a change in this policy. And secondly, while the Corps was proposing a dam on the St. Croix River or on its tributaries, Legislation to establish a St. Croix as a wild and scenic river was in Congress at the same time the dam was proposed. And the Corps did not handle the situation well. It requested the Department of Interior study the wildlife and conservation value of the project, and again tried to emphasize the holistic watershed planning it was moving to with maximum benefits to the local population. However, it also surfaced that the Corps had requested the wild and scenic Rivers legislation be delayed in the Senate while these new studies were completed. The Department of Interior would not cooperate after this, and Congress de declined to fund the new core study. And in November 1968, the Wild and Scenic Rivers Bill finally passed Congress, and the St. Croix River, along with its major tributaries, was one of the first eight rivers to be preserved in its free flowing, unmodified condition. The experience did lead to changes in the way the court did business in terms of the aforementioned policy changes of project benefits and with and to include far, far more local and regional consultation and transparency. So the river came a long way from being jammed with logs and structures to today's wild and scenic river. The second dam that the Corps never built was the Lafarge Dam. The Kickapoo River had major floods in 1907, 1917, 1956, 1961, and you get the picture. In addition, this area was underdeveloped and poor. Studies had begun as early as 1938 to build a dam on the river and stimulate the local economy. It was not until 1962 when a core study recommended a multi-purpose earth-filled dam at Lafarge and other flood control work at two downstream communities. In addition to flood prevention, it was thought the recreation and other opportunities would contribute greatly to the economic development of the area, and Congress authorized the project and land acquisition began in 1968. The Sierra Club and other environmental uh, organizations sued, and even though they lost well into the construction of the project, the state of Wisconsin reconsidered its support, though this project for the first time required an environmental impact statement, a later Wisconsin state study concluded that the dam would damage wildlife and forests, cause soil erosion and silting, and the destruction of archeological resources. The most significant criticism was that the proposed lake, lake water quality would be poor. But the project did have very strong local support. While all of this was being argued, the dam reached 90 or 75% complete but in addition to the environmental concerns, inflation, big cost overruns and delays, this caused Congress to reconsider and Lafarge Dam was deauthorized in 1975. It was said by one St. Paul historic, historian that if Lafarge Dam had been started five years earlier, there would have never been any problems. If suggested five years later, it would have never gotten off the ground. It was definitely a product of its time. talk a little bit about environmental concerns and concentrate on dredging as an example. With the growing environmental movement of the 1960s and 70s, I had mentioned some examples of how the Corps has already, already had to change its way of doing business on projects. Recall again that under the Refuse Act, the Corps had the authority to regulate obstructions and the dumping of pollutants in rivers and harbors, and its responsibility was to ensure that the water supplied by the Corps, by Corps projects was clean. 
In Wisconsin, this was reflected in the Corps' harbor dredging. Until the 1960s, dredge spoil was hauled out to a designated area in the lake and just dumped. However, as seen with the Lafarge Dam, the public, state governments, and the citizens would not necessarily uh, would not necessarily always be in agreement with the Corps. The issue became the disposal of polluted and contaminated material dredged from Great Lakes harbors. For the Corps, it was much more than an environmental issue because this change in disposal method would cause costs to rise substantially. However, there was no turning back and districts and lakes had to adapt to this reality. Districts on the lakes had to adapt to this reality and in 1966 initiated with other federal agencies, a pilot program for determining alternate methods of disposal of polluted dredgings for the entire Great Lakes area. The findings included the conclusion that each harbor, harbor was unique in the kind of pollutants found and source of pollutants and the practicality of controlling such sources and the availability of, of alternate disposal sites would all be difficult. But it also concluded that diked disposal areas were the best solution, at least in the short and medium term. This issue is, is very complicated with multiple stakeholders involved and issues over funding, cost sharing with local entities, clean water, the authority to create contain and the authority to con create new contained dredge areas. Fortunately, Congress authorized this in 1870, but the new landscape, which required EPA approval and local involvement, creating a new approval process, meant that the first contained dredge facilities were not built until 1972 near Milwaukee and Kenosha harbors. It was not smooth sailing at all after this uh, first contained dredge facility opened, but at least there was a system to continue keeping the harbors open and ensuring clean water. As the Corps became far more transparent, for example, publishing dredging schedules, working to differentiate clean from contaminated spoil, and working to find beneficial uses for clean spoil, such as for beach replenishment on icy streets in the winter. The Corps and the citizens were finally able, were able to come to an agreement and a way forward to both keep harbors open and also address environmental concerns with the dredging spoil. couple of final mission areas to address very briefly. In 1941, the, the Corps of Engineers took over responsibility for military construction from the quartermaster. And although this did not affect Wisconsin a great deal, the Corps did have several military construction projects in the state. In Wisconsin, during and after World War II, the Corps' main military construction projects were Camp McCoy and Camp Douglas and Volk Field and a radio school Toma, Wisconsin. And the Corps also built a veterans hospital in Madison after the war. And then recreation. I mentioned the recreation opportunities available at the lakes like uh, Lake Winnebago and, Algod and Ogal Dam. Those are really the only two managed lake recreation sites in the state, but perhaps uniquely the Corps does have 10 recreation areas along the Mississippi River between Minnesota and Wisconsin which are associated with navigation locks, but uh, also have recreation facilities available. And then the last thing to mention is the Fountain City, Wisconsin service base, sometimes called the Fountain City Boatyard, where the Wamanati Creek joins the Mississippi River and fo it forms a protective harbor. And starting in the late 1880s, Corps started mooring work vessels in the vicinity. In 1885, it purchased the land to establish a construction and maintenance base for its water vessels, soon to be called the Fountain City Boat Yard. By 1940, there were 200 core vessels operating out of Fountain City on the Upper Mississippi. Under the St. Paul District, the boat yard operates today, continuing to maintain a much smaller fleet, as well as serving other logistical support functions in the district. And that concludes my brief survey of the history of the Corps of Engineers work in Wisconsin. Again, I know I've not covered everything, certainly not everything the Corps does or the Corps has done, but tried, tried to cover what I could in the time allotted to me. Once again, I'd like to thank the Forest History Association of Wisconsin for this opportunity, and I'll stand by for any questions.
All right, thanks, uh, Erica. A really fascinating uh, overview of the coursework in Wisconsin and the history of it, and it's particularly uh, you know how how it relates to the development of Wisconsin. Quite fascinating. Um, so, I as the facilitator, I always get to ask my question first, right? <laughs> but it's really not a question. But you talked about the uh, creation of Wisconsin the state of Wisconsin, and there was a tremendous controversy over the border between Michigan and Wisconsin. Uh, the original engineer who surveyed it said the Montreal River uh, started at Lac Voudesire and went to Lake Superior, and that was the border. Well, it didn't do that. And then they they drew a line from Lac Voudesire to the uh, Montreal River, the headwaters of the Montreal River, but they failed to say which branch of the Montreal River. And so Michigan and Wisconsin continued to argue over that until 1926. And, and partly because of the mineral resources that were in that region, iron ore, copper, all those things. So it's just a little trip down the sidelines here, uh, but it's a fascinating story uh, about the statehood development. So I'm going to open up the chat here and start uh, throwing some questions your way. All right. Uh, from Don, uh, what records might uh, be available online uh, to search uh, for the comp uh, work completed by the Army Corps of Engineers, if any? And are there any uh, resources available for the public to use? Uh Yes, although it's not going to be a great deal of primary source material, but all of our district division, in fact, every history that's been produced either by my office or by districts and divisions is available online. And, uh, you know, I had the bibliography up there and we can maybe we can make arrangements to get that out for people. But uh, there's a. Uh, um. I guess if you maybe Googled Corps of Engineers Digital Library, that might get you to the site. But you can you can browse through there, and like I say, every history has been digitized. You find histories from all the d uh, districts that were involved in the development of Wisconsin, and that's where I would start. All right. And so some of these are just comments, but I'll read uh, read them, and you can react to them. That slide of the Milwaukee Harbor was so interesting it will become part of the information I have from my Dutch great-grandparents. They immigrated from the Netherlands to America in 1868. Their first two years were in an area called Lake in Milwaukee. So just somebody connecting to the Milwaukee Harbor. And then uh, the uh, same person, Mary, uh, commented about the Fox River uh, lock and dam system and how it's one of the only uh, uh, hand cranked locks in America uh, that is uh, handled. Uh, and if you've ever been there, it's fascinating to watch them in progress. Any comments? Oh, uh, I'd, I'd love to get there sometime. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so here's a question that I think you had addressed. What's the what's the status of the partially completed completed Lafarge Dam, and what does it look like today? The structures are still there; they have not been removed. Um, I don't know if it's part of a recognized area because I didn't follow up on that. But uh, but the structures are definitely still there, and and you can go see them. You know, lots of pictures on the internet of people going and seeing them. I mean, obviously they made they made it safe. You know, uh, uh, anything that was dangerous would have been removed at the time, and it's monitored. Uh, I don't know if you saw Tom, but there's a remark toward the bottom of the comments that there's a visitor center at Lafarge. Yeah, I at the I mean I I didn't you know. I'm prone to going down rabbit holes, so I had to stop myself when I'm researching this sort of thing. So I don't remember who maintains it now, but I know it's 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 an area that you can go visit. 
Okay, and the comment goes on that it's a it's a nature reserve now. Okay. Well, since it's associated with the St. Croix River, I, I would have thought. Uh, I'm sorry, this is Kickapoo River. Uh, 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 the, the Kickapoo but, uh, but still. Is, the Kickapoo is almost as sacred as the St. Croix, though, in Wisconsin. They're both uh, beloved river systems, which it was interesting to hear the stories about, um, you know, the battles over these dams and uh, particularly the St. Croix was uh, a fascinating story that you could do a whole uh, whole presentation on, I think. Uh, so Ken, Kenton uh, made a comment partially addressing uh, one of the uh, questions earlier. It says the Corps of Engineers annual chief reports are online, and that would be the annual reports for uh, all listed core projects. Yeah, you can access that through the same site that I mentioned where the district and division histories are. Yeah. And everything can be downloaded as a PDF and saved, you know, to read at your leisure. And evidently at the visitor center in Lafarge, there is a, a really interesting uh, history of that. Um, you know, so the other thing that uh, there, you know, what fascinated me was that originally the definition of uh, navigation, at least Wisconsin, was whether you could float an eight foot uh, saw log down a stream to find whether a stream was uh, publicly navigable. Uh, it wasn't anything about boating. It was about, all about the logs. Yeah, it's it. I'm I'm sure there are already published histories on the logging industry but that that really was was fascinating and it's it it shows how conservative the, the core the core was at that time even when it did eventually get the authority to uh to enforce navigation as the primary uh uh uh, uh purpose on the on the harbor it it uh it uh it just uh decided not to in a lot of ways uh, the the a lot of the histories point out that it was really the national leadership that was cautious not the local district commanders in trying to uh mediate these uh these uh disputes between the logging companies and the and the citizens i find it uh interesting uh that you know after the saint croix and lafarge uh i don't believe there were very many major dams on the major tributaries in Wisconsin after those two situations failed. You know, all of the dams we have now are, you know, from the, uh, a lot of them were hydroelectric dams from the electrification era, but uh, at, particularly after the St. Croix, um, you know, dam building uh, pretty much stopped. You look at the Wisconsin River, I mean, there's 21, 20 some dams up and down the river. And, and of course, they generate a lot of uh, green energy, hydropower. Uh, but there are also other problems with uh, uh, fish passage and navigation that you pointed out. I had one question that showed up in the question and answer uh, section from Ed Forrester. He asks whether or not there is a file or document that focuses on the conflicts between the steamboats and log drives on the Mississippi. For the purposes of, of my talk, I didn't dive into the any primary documents, but I would suggest consulting the, uh, the St. Paul district history on the, on the, the Corps of Engineers library website that I referred to. Uh, and it, it discusses a lot of these conflicts in great detail, and it'll have uh, also sources for primary documents. It's a, it's a relatively old history. It hasn't been updated, but uh, it's still got a lot of good information in there. And it really goes into detail uh, uh, on, uh, you know, naming names and, 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 and uh, people who uh, uh, tried, to, tried to work on these conflicts. Those old records that haven't been updated are some of the best. <laughs> no, I think we've uh, uh, ex uh, covered all of the questions. I just wanted to thank you, Eric. I, I have to admit, I thought this was going to be 
not very interesting, uh, but you made it interesting. Uh, and uh, particularly, you know, because I'm so versed in Wisconsin waterways, uh, I, I found the details that you shared really interesting. So I, I'm, I was all wrong. Uh, it was a very good presentation. Yeah, and, and I agree. To, uh, we've got a comment here that from uh, Mary Jurgatis, who said enjoyed this a lot. And then Jim Remline, uh, who was a past board member, said that he thought it was a very interesting and timely presentation. Well done. Uh, and I have to say, I have a better appreciation now uh, of some of the services that the Corps of Engineers have provided over the year that I didn't think about before. So I also agree, it was a very good presentation. So thank you, Eric, for joining us tonight. Uh, yeah. Thank everyone in the audience for joining us also. In a couple minutes after this webinar ends, you'll get an email with a survey, and I hope you'll take time to answer it. It's brief, there's only seven questions, uh, but it helps us plan future conferences, webinars, and lets us know what we can do better or uh, what you thought of the presentation and things. So take a few minutes and provide that feedback. It's much appreciated. Next month, uh, we are, we're scheduled to have a webinar on the third Wednesday of October. We've had to move that date. Uh, so the webinar next month is actually going to be held on November 8th. The title of that is Land Restoration at Woodland Dunes Nature Center and Preserve. And that one will be again November 8th at 6.30 p.m. rather than the third Wednesday of October. Hope to see you all there. And with that, yeah, uh, anything else, Tom? Yeah, one quick last minute comment. Kenton Spading says, hi, Eric. He evidently works for the Corps and knows you. Yeah, I uh, the the little pop-up on my screen, uh, so I saw he was he was he was on there. So he he can tell me everything I got wrong. Yeah, <laughs> there's always one in the crowd. <laughs> Thanks yeah, again, but he, he knows. Have a good night. <laughs> I can. Well, yeah, thank you, thank you for inviting me. I enjoyed this. Good.